even if the police are investigating people plotting a terrorist attack or sharing child abuse material, they can't access that data in such a way that it can be read in the clear and that it can be used as evidence of anything. You might think, oh, quantum computing is a thing already. It's not really. Hello and welcome. My name is Richard Tavener. I am the AV and Broadcast Officer at Gresham College and your host of our new podcast, Any Further Questions. My guest today is our IT livery company professor of information technology, Dr. Victoria Baines. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having me, Richard. Really pleased to be here. Great. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you for doing this. This is our first uh, podcast of this nature. Let me start by introducing our guest. She's a leading authority in the field of online trust, safety and cybersecurity. Um, She frequently contributes to major broadcast media outlets on digital ethics, cybercrime and the misuse of emerging technologies, including extended reality and artificial intelligence. For several years, Victoria was Facebook's trust and safety manager for Europe, Middle East and Africa. She began her career in law enforcement in 2005 as a higher intelligence analyst for Surrey Police. And in 2008, the International Association for Law Enforcement Intelligent Analysts recognised her work with a global award for outstanding achievement. So you're more than qualified. um, Analyst of the year, no less. (laughs) (laughs) She is. Seems like a very long time ago. (laughs) I know, but but it, it lends itself well to our discussion. Professor Baines gave a lecture for us, her fourth of her series of six lectures. The series was called Humanising Cyberspace, and the lecture of discussion is, what's the problem with encryption? So end-to-end encryption secures messages before they leave a device, preventing them from being read in transit. So WhatsApp is probably the Hmm. the most widely known messaging app that uses end-to-end encryption. You explained it in your lecture, but you can talk about it a bit um, later on. But if you haven't watched the lecture, then please do. It's on our on our. YouTube Even channel. if you have watched it, watch yeah. it again. Yeah, watch it again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I, I watched it before today's discussion. It's great. It's really, really interesting. So increasingly, the default protocol for messaging apps, neither governments nor the platforms on which it operates can access unscrambled communications and message content. Some governments have demanded backdoors for criminal investigations, while others have exploited workarounds to access the encrypted messages of political dissidents. So the talk considered the current public discourse on online surveillance and privacy and where society might go from here. So what was it that you wanted to get across in your lecture? Why did you decide to lecture on this topic and what was it that you wanted to the for us to understand. Yeah, so I I, I think what I keep coming back to in all of my lectures in in this year's series are some of the tough questions Mm. um, and the decisions that society have to make that will have consequences one way or another. Um, And some of those tough decisions are quite controversial. Um, And the controversy around end-to-end encryption is that because... Um, the messages are scrambled, they can still be accessed. So a law enforcement agency or an intelligence agency that wants to essentially wiretap your conversations, they can do, but when they get those messages, they can't be read because they're still scrambled. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about encryption, it's quite a fancy word, isn't it? But And and in the lecture, which you should watch, um, I do a, a brief history of cryptography in about seven and a half minutes, I think, which I would like to put forward as for a Guinness World Record, because I'm not sure anyone's ever done a brief history of cryptography in seven in and a half quick, minutes. Yeah. It's quite a good title for something. Yeah, that's no, great. Um, and, um, and, and, and in that, really looking at how for thousands of years, society and individuals have realised that they need to protect their communications, whether you're mm. Julius Caesar using your substitution cipher and, you know, jumping your letters ahead by five from A to E or whatever, Um, you know that you don't want people intercepting your messages, whether that's physically intercepting a letter and opening that letter. And and we've all grown up with those kind of Cold War notions of steaming open letters Mm. and, you know, resealing them and... um, I don't know about you, but as a kid, I remember being fascinated learning how to write in lemon juice. I never, Did you not do that? No, you I didn't. write in know. lemon juice. And okay. of course, you can't see it, but when you put it up against a radiator or a fire, you can. suddenly it comes out oh, that's in like cool. slightly tea-stained writing. I probably had a more modern version of that. I had the pens. So we had these white, well, these, these felt-tip pens yes, that I had white Yes, I remember those nibs. as well. 
and yeah. you could write whatever you liked and you couldn't see what you were writing. It was like a colour wash. But it was a colour thing, yeah. yeah. And I think if you either, I think if you put it, is it ultra, maybe putting it in front of ultraviolet light or if you wash something over it, it would then reveal your message. For any parents out there, I would like to suggest That's the cool. lemon juice trick. Okay. Just because it's a slightly less toxic and sustainable yeah. version. Yeah, of yeah, of course, of what I <laughs> probably Proving the used. same point. Yeah. But I think, you know, I was a child of the 70s and 80s. We didn't yeah. really care about toxicity <laughs> in the 70s and 80s. Um, but... Um, yeah, so we have this very long history of wanting to protect our communications. We have also just as long mm. had a, that history of, yes, but under certain circumstances, your government can intercept those messages. So thinking about, you know, in, uh, opening somebody's mail. Mm. And there are really good reasons to scan people's mail, mm. for instance, if they contain anthrax or ricin. You mm. know, there are there are... Even aside from the written content of a message, there are good reasons to scan people's mail. Yeah. Um, when we had um, this proliferation of digital communications, um, there then was this parallel trend for law enforcement and intelligence agencies to request that data to get into people's communications. And it became, and this is no disrespect to those agencies, it became a treasure trove of information, the like of which we didn't have before. Mm. And I was in the police at the time mm. um, as an analyst, and it was amazing the amount of data that we had access to, both metadata, mm. so the, the kind of the transactional data of when you logged on, whose phone number you messaged, for instance, and the content data, so the, the, the you know the contents of those messages. End-to-end mm. um, -end encryption doesn't necessarily obscure the metadata. You know, so if you're using WhatsApp, you can still, you know, the, the police can still request the data of when you logged on. Although mm. these days we don't log on and log off anymore, do we? We used to ten years ago, but now we're just always, always constantly on. logged in. Yeah. But you know, the last IP address. Yeah for your device, yeah. it will capture. The police can still get that. They can still get um, the phone numbers that you're in contact with, so your address book. Mm. Now, when, when I was in the police, I was a, a drugs analyst for a bit. Mm. It was fantastic to get this kind of data to know the who movements. the drugs networks were made up of. And yep. if they weren't using burner phones, mm. as they're known in the police, disposable phones that people get rid of, mm. you could actually then go to the phone company and say to the phone company, um, who does this phone belong to? And you get subscriber information. That's all metadata. Mm. What end-to-end -end encryption makes difficult is reading the content of the messages. So yes. like I said, you can still get the data and there are processes in place in the UK, in most law-abiding, not repressive countries um, for the courts to issue those kinds of requests. Okay. Um, in the UK, if you want the content of somebody's messages... Um, or a kind of live wiretap that has to go through the Home Secretary. Oh, really? Okay. Or their, or their responsible person. Yeah. Um, in lots of other countries, that would go to a High Court judge because mm. it would be a search warrant, essentially. It's like searching in your digital, di digital communications as you would searching in somebody's house. Mm. Um, so there's a, there's a barrier to entry there, which is, there is, which is very strong. Well, there should okay. always be a barrier to entry. Yes. And I think this is a really interesting question because, in yes, in the UK, in the US, in EU countries, for instance, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and lots of other countries that we could name, there is a legal process, there's legal oversight. In some countries, there isn't. In mm. some countries... Um, and I would include China, North Korea, Iran, to a certain extent, Russia. There are either laws in place that say um, tech companies have to hand over everybody's data just whenever they're asked. Mm. Um, or there is a presumption that your communications are just not secure. Mm. Um, and one of the um, case studies that we consider in the lecture is um, the murder of the Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Mm. Um, and after his murder um, at the um, in Istanbul, um, and I won't go into the whys and wherefores of who might have been responsible for that, um, but there's some fairly strong evidence <laughs> as to who was, who was responsible for that. Um, uh, probably not coincidentally, but simultaneously there was compromise of his inner circles WhatsApp communications 
Um, and so, obviously, as a journalist and an activist, he had been using end-to-end encrypted communication, but a particular government mm. seems to have found it interesting to subvert that security. Mm. So we, we use this phrase in cybersecurity that it's an arms race between the good guys and the bad guys. Mm. As you will know from my other lectures, I'm not always very fond of those metaphors that make cybersecurity something that's exclusively militaristic yeah. and for the yeah. big macho guys, you yes. know. But arms race is quite a good way of describing how it's kind of, it's cat and mouse to a certain extent. Yeah. That the technology develops, the bad guys make use of it, and then the good guys have to catch up. Catch up, yeah. And then sometimes the good guys try and get ahead of things, but that can be really challenging, trying to say, well, we, we need to put something in place because this is going to be problematic. Mm. Technology is going faster I think technology is always traveling faster than government legislation. It always will be. So there's always going to be that sense of catch up. And in some senses, because of that catch up, I think the damage is already done by the time government get there to try and put a stop to it. Damage in the sense that it's already advanced enough that the government, what what legislation the government are putting in is not enough. Definitely, definitely. I yeah. think that's the case. And, and what we're seeing now, particularly with end-to-end encryption, but in the wider context in the UK of the online safety bill, mm. is you can see a government machinery and parliament that are quite rightly and quite understandably trying to get ahead and use a bit of foresight. So yeah. The online safety bill is considering things like the metaverse, another subject of one of my lectures, um, that, um, you know, isn't really here yet, Mm. but trying to future proof that legislation. But that's really difficult, particularly when you're thinking about criminal offences, because if we start legislating for things that aren't here yet, Mm. that's the kind of thing that repressive regimes do. They legislate against, they, they ban something because they think it could be subversive or it could be problematic. So it's weighing weighing that balance. It's it's absolutely minority report. But but you're absolutely right. There's this sweet spot that's really difficult to achieve, which is not being too repressive, not harming innovation, but at the same time keeping people safe. And that's exactly the controversy when it comes to -to end-to-end encryption Mm. is... Of course we want our messages to be secure. The trouble is that with end-to-end encryption, it's either on for everybody or it's off for everybody. Mm. Um, And that means that even if the police are investigating people plotting a terrorist attack or sharing child abuse material, they can't access that data in such a way that it can be read in the clear and that it can be used as evidence of anything. Um, and they've been so used to doing that for the last 20 years, really, yeah. that it, it threatens to change how police and safeguarding organisations do their work. Yes. Now, so that takes us to the the, the crux of the problem, yeah. which is governments, particularly the UK government and child protection agencies, will say um, quite, quite a, a targeted statement, if you like, which is children are going to be less safe this will make it easier for people to harm them. Now, I would say, and I would say this as someone who's actually worked on child abuse investigations for the last 15 years, Mm. logically, we can't say that. Mm. We can say the police are not going to be able to read the data in such a way that they can present the evidence or that they can prevent harm the way that they have always prevented harm. Mm. So then what happens? Well, either it becomes a free-for-all for for people who want to harm children Mm. or technology companies and governments and other stakeholders have to come up with new ways of dealing with the problem. Mm. Um, For governments, that might mean, and I have written about this, so I'm not just coming up with this from the, you know, off the top of my head, that might mean going back to old policing methods and funding the police in such a way that they can do more covert investigations where they infiltrate groups. Now, as we know, in many countries, we have challenges around resourcing for the police. Actually, we don't have enough police officers. You don't see them anymore. We need investigators 
who are trained there's a there's a there's a particular strand of police investigation called covert internet investigation and that is to be the person that goes into a group of criminals online a whatsapp group for instance and if you're a member of that group you can read all of the interactions so that's not a problem in itself um to be slightly controversial here um that's a much more expensive way of doing those investigations than just harvesting a lot of data from tech companies. Yes. So there are cost implications. It doesn't make it impossible to protect children. It makes it more expensive for government. So that could possibly be one of the reasons why the government want to do this is because of a cost. It's more cost effective yeah. to do it, f to collect the data rather than put lots of more money, fund more money into the police force. And I, and I don't think they're being underhand work. and dishonest by presenting it in the way of, you know, children will be less safe. Yeah. I think there, there is a genuine future shock. You know, there was this book in the 70s by Alvin Toffler called Future Shock, and it's fantastic because it, it identifies why people are resistant to technological change and resistant to change full stop because, of course, we're all in our comfort zones when we get to continue doing the things that we've already done, mm -hmm. you know, for many, many years. Um, what end-to-end -end encryption does is it threatens that paradigm. Mm -hmm. It says, actually, no, you can't do that anymore. You need to find a new way of doing it. And none of us like that. The In the current debates, particularly around legislation like the Online Safety Bill, the presumption is that because the technologies, because the tech companies came up with the technology, mm. that they are responsible for finding the solution and for funding it. But what keeps getting forgotten, and particularly in some of the open letters that we've had from governments to say to Mark Zuckerberg, you know, the chief executive of Meta, is that he didn't build end-to-end -end encryption end-to-end no. -end encryption predates and actually you know is just developed very separately from what apple developed from what meta developed they adopted it because it was the default way to secure people's messaging so or, or it became the default way to secure people's messages but if you look at it from a marketing point of view the reason they're doing it is because it's it's asked for from the consumer you say Apple and Google, they're going to say we've got the most secure messaging app. Ours is more secure than the other company. People are going to people are going to want to go to them because for that reason. So that's another reason why they've adopted it is because it sell it sells. Mm. It's a it's a, an attractive notion to use um, a piece of tech or an app that you know is not going to be infiltrated by outside eyes. So that's another that's probably another reason. So you're right, it's not the tech company's fault. All they're doing is following consumer trend. All they're doing all they're doing is following what their customers want from them, essentially. I, I think that's right. At the same time, I think it's also absolutely right that if you're providing a social media platform, mm. you should have some means to identify when vulnerable users are at risk yeah. or when there's evidence of a crime. And an internationally recognised crime might include um, child abuse material. Um, and the default ways of spotting that have relied on being able to scan the content of the messages, which is not possible in the same way in end-to-end -end encryption. So, so the tech companies need to come up with a new way of doing that. And in, in the um, lecture, I talk about client-side scanning. So bearing in mind that with end-to-end -end encryption, um, it's scrambled in transit, but you can read it in the clear on your phone. And your phone is now a very powerful computer, much more powerful than any of the computers that, well, the, certainly the computer that I had as a kid. Um, and so you can use that processing power to scan for illegal material. And Apple announced that they were going to do this, but there was outcry from privacy organisations. So this is this is where the difficult choice comes into play, because... I can always see all sides of this problem yeah. because I've worked in the police and wanted all the data all of the time to keep people safe. Yeah. Because I then work for Facebook, um, because I support a number of different charities and organisations, I can see how all of these positions are valid. But what we need to come up with are new solutions. The mm. curious thing 
is that what we have in legislation and that has been the focus of some of the news coverage that we've had in the last few days where um, the heads of WhatsApp and Signal and other large encrypted messaging platforms have sent an open letter Mm. to um, the UK government on the online safety bill is that, um, you know, the the legislators have included in their current draft of this um, bill going through Parliament the idea that even though end-to-end encryption prevents scanning for child abuse material, companies are still going to need to scan end-to-end encrypted messages. And technically, mathematically, that's currently impossible. And I don't really know of another piece of legislation that mandates with you know, um, promises of financial penalties, but also it's been suggested criminal penalties for executives. There's been a lot of talk around locking up big tech executives. Um, I don't know of any other piece of legislation where a government says, right, you need to enforce something that technically it hasn't been possible to build yet. Mm. That's a really unusual situation to be in. I can see exactly why the government has got into that situation. Yeah. But how how do you say, I don't care if it doesn't exist, you've still got to do it? It, it's a, it's a strange this well this is what we were going to come into so we'll we'll talk more about it in our in our news mm. section um but just to mention that currently the online safety bill as of the 19th of April today is in the committee stage in mm. the House of Lords and I remember you mentioning before we went on air that you said it's gone back and forth a few times yeah so yeah. there's no real telling on the length of time that this will take and it could be amended in the in the meantime as well so. there are there are still lots of groups suggesting further amendments and of yeah. course every time new amendments every time the draft is changed or something is added um then it takes it has to go through again and it takes longer so do you know what it, it, specific to our conversation today about end-to-end encryption mm. do you know what is in the online safety bill that that is what does it exactly say about end-to-end encryption at the moment right now. Essentially, it says, and, and, and this you'll hear this coming out in government statements really over the last four to five years on the issue, mm. is they say, you know, we believe in strong encryption, but you also need to find some way of scanning content so that, um, you know, children can be protected. So it makes and no sense. It, it, mm, in a, in a, yeah. It, it makes sense theoretically. Yes. Practically speaking. Mm. We haven't come up with a way, nobody's come up with a way that is, has been accepted. Apple thought they had with client-side scanning mm. and child protection organisations and governments were really, really pleased about that. But the risk, of course, and, and this is what you know, Apple have said every single time, is if we, we, have, to do, if we have to do this, you, you can't just say, oh, we'll do it for the UK and the US because they're nice countries, but we won't do it for China and yeah. Iran. Yeah. And then there is always the risk of being compelled to do it for things other than child abuse material as well. And as powerful as Apple is, you know, this is where we get into discussions like the ones that we've been seeing over the last couple of days, um, which is if you force us to do this, we will just shut down our service in your country. And this is why it matters to listeners of this podcast, because we, we are literally talking about us waking up one day and not being able to use WhatsApp. Mm. Mm. Even the UK government uses WhatsApp, it's as so we've ingrained. learned over the last few weeks. It's, yeah. it's so ingrained in our society. Yeah. It's been it's used not just socially. It's used by businesses, as you've said, and it's used it's used by uh, Gresham. You know, um, mm. my colleagues are on a on a WhatsApp group with with me, and we we discuss things to do with um, our day-to-day workflow in, in Gresham College as well. So, yeah, it's it would be catastrophic if something were to happen like that. And, yeah. and equally, you know, you think about that in terms of business competitiveness. Mm. If you are a business in the UK, you do business with the EU or with the US, you use WhatsApp to communicate about when the deliveries are going to arrive and you suddenly have to go, oh, I'm terribly sorry, we don't use WhatsApp anymore. Mm. Mm. And and that security measure, you, you're effectively saying our business isn't as concerned with security as your business mm. is. You mm. know, it's, it has that kind of knock on impact. And and I think it also takes us to because I know we're, we're going to consider some of these questions, aren't we? But yes. we, we had a question, didn't we, from our online audience that we didn't have time to get to, which was 
if the US and UK governments are against end-to-end -end encryption, why not outlaw it? Yeah, that's um, a great question. Because, I mean, the, the, the it's, gosh, again, you could do an entire workshop on that question. Mm, mm. Um, because then it would be possible for all governments and criminal hackers to read our messages when they intercept them. Um, and that has two big impacts, really. The first one is that criminals are looking for ways to monetize our sensitive data. So an everyday example of that impact would be that you and I would no longer be able to safely send our bank details, our home address or our date of birth to anybody. Yeah. Um, because, you know, we, we all revert to things like WhatsApp and Signal or iMessage on our iPhones mm. to do that because we know it's encrypted. Mm. Um if it isn't, anyone can just, if they can get into that, they can read all of that data. And, and, and even in terms of cost impact, that's going to have a bigger cost impact on UK PLC mm. than we might imagine. It's, it's the vulnerability of it all, yeah. which, which is the concerning factor. When you were talking about the police and working for the police and the police being able to not see the messages word for word, but see the location and mm. the IP and all that kind of stuff. And a question came to mind, which probably our listeners might have thought of as well. Watching a show like 24 Hours in Police Custody, there are scenes where you see the police looking at messages between the, the, the alleged criminal and someone else, and they can see them word for word. So how does that, how does that work? Have they had to go through a process in order to see that? Or are they given special rights because the person's in custody? Or how does that... There are lots of different ways. So okay. it would depend. Um, it might not necessarily have been WhatsApp. but Yeah, sure. Okay. So um, there are different routes to gaining that evidence. The first one is if you have a victim of a crime mm. and they have been on the receiving end of those messages, they can themselves provide that data as their own evidence. Uh, and a lot of the time, the police prefer this, of course, because then they don't have to go through a lengthy procedure of yeah. requesting it from a US tech company. That makes sense, yeah. Um, okay. Sometimes um, there's also, um, you know, seizing somebody's phone. Mm. And you can say, well, could you open your phone for me, please? Would you hand over your data? And sometimes if people are confessing to a crime, mm. they will do that. And okay. they'll say, look, I'm really ashamed. Yes, you can have that data. So it's all t so so in those both examples, it's to do with the person who owns that data. And it's voluntary and voluntary it's a consent of the, that data owner. You're okay. absolutely it's right. when you don't allow yeah. voluntary access to it. Okay. So sometimes your phone could be seized mm. when you're arrested and that could be sent to a high-tech crime unit and they would do analysis of that phone. Mm. That can take a long time mm. because, as you can imagine, high-tech crime units in police forces are quite small mm. and they have huge backlogs. Mm. Right, so that's... So, so I'm sometimes a little bit sceptical when I see these kind of live in the room, yes, true crime documentaries where somebody goes, "We've had we've had the results back from the high tech crime unit." I'm thinking that will take three them. months. <laughs> wow, how a lot how of you've managed has gone to do on that? There, yeah, I mean, there are kind of emergency requests that can be made in yes, very in, specific yeah. circumstances. Equally, you can do an emergency request to a tech company. Yeah. So there are procedures in place to do that. Okay. Um, what you can certainly get a lot quicker is that metadata, so that transactional data of who called who when. Which, in the circumstances, might just be enough. Might be enough. Yeah. Because if you've... So if, if you're for tracking example, movement. If you're tracking movement, certainly. Yeah. But equally, if you have a victim and they say, look, these are the messages I received, or this is when I had a call, mm. it was an audio message, here's the audio message, and then you have the, the suspect's data... Mm saying um, the metadata that says call this number at this time, you can link the two. Yeah. I mean, in fact, people, analysts like me used to link the two in yeah. nice big charts. Um, but when you, for instance, if you don't have access to any of that data, but you need to request the content of the messages from a US tech company, and that ordinarily that would be a mutual legal assistance request Okay. Via the UK Central Authority and the Ministry of Justice mm. to the US Department of Justice Office for International Assistance, <laughs> which then asked the District Court of Northern California to serve a search warrant on the tech companies in Silicon Valley. Okay. Now, the Long UK winded. and the US have agreed 
that from now on, UK authorities can request data directly from US tech companies and just kind of a bit like an email, just CC yeah. the US Department of Justice in it. But those agreements need to be made in the first place. That's yeah, the so that, thing. that so agreement that. has been made and yeah. it is starting up. It, it doesn't exist in most other countries. Okay. So there's, it's this strange situation where, un, you know, until very recently, it was literally illegal mm. for US tech companies to just hand over the content of somebody's messages. Um, to non-US agencies. Mm. Um, I mean, there's another question around why don't we just ban end-to-end encryption? And that is, we've talked a lot about UK and US, and there's a presumption, isn't there? And And I think it's not entirely unassailable, but there is a presumption that UK and US are good countries where there's policing by consent mm. and they have to go through a legal process to request data. Look, by and large, I think that's true. Mm. Um, there are some genuine concerns in the US at the moment around reproductive rights. And now that, you know, Roe versus Wade has been thrown out and there are fewer protections for women who want to have abortions, yeah. there's nervousness around requesting some of that data um, from people talking about their sexual health and their reproductive rights or people using apps that track their reproductive rights, Mm. that those might be requested, like that's really inappropriate, Mm. but it might be legal to do that in some states. And Mm. that is a genuine concern. Mm. However, by and large, we've got rule of law. We have a process of legal oversight for requesting people's data. Yeah. But if you're in many other countries around the world, that process is not in place. You live in fear of, for your life mm-hmm. if you say something that's critical of the government. So we, you know, we mentioned the example of Jamal Khashoggi. You know, if you're a political activist, if you're a journalist, um, and the government is a repressive regime, they have an interest in getting into your communications to prove that you've committed a crime or to find out where you are so that they can threaten you or hurt you. Mm. Um, And it comes down to a question of, do we think we're good global citizens? There's been some criticism in the news of the online safety bills provisions around end-to-end encryption. We've had for the first time a politician from a legitimate, you know, mainstream political party saying, you can't have a British internet. And yes, you know, plug my first talk of the series, who owns the internet? That's the whole, that's the crux of that question is, there's no such thing unless you're North Korea even if you're North Korea, Mm. there's no such thing as a national internet. Mm. Um, So so this idea that, you know, but we can ban encryption because we're the UK and we're a good country and we like to keep people safe. It's a brilliant aspiration. Yeah. But once end-to-end encryption is shot down for one country, is shot down for for everybody. Yeah. And I feel that as global citizens, we have a duty to protect those yeah, we have a duty to protect Uyghurs in China. Yes. We have a duty to protect people who are fearing for their safety in other countries. It's mm. a global human rights issue. Mm. Mm. I su- yeah, it's it 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 doesn't become it, I suppose it's not an in, it's not an internet, it's an intranet if mm. it's if it's localized. And mm. we all remember how bad those were. Yeah. <laughs> we do. <laughs> Let's move on to our, well, we, we touched upon it, our, our second feature, unanswered questions. Mm. So these are your questions, which you sent online. So we have four questions. One of them, Victoria's just answered. So we're talking about these algorithms that make yeah. your, um, that, that essentially um, make the encryption. Are they secure? How secure are they? Can they be compromised? Um, I, I mean, I'm going to oversimplify massively mm. here. Um, but essentially, they are secure for a certain length of time. Okay. Um, they are secure um, only as far as the time and processing power that is required to crack them. Mm. So I mentioned in the lecture that there are various international standards that developed over the last 20 to 30 years. And one of these was the data encryption standard, so triple DES. And that used a 56-bit key mm. to encrypt data. Um, and there, was the, there is the advanced encryption se- um, system, AES, which used multiple rounds of encryption with 128-bit, 192-bit, 256-bit keys. Um, there's RSA, um, which uses variable keys. 
even much longer, mm. 1,024 to 4,096 bits in length. Um, now, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, they cracked DES in 1998. So they proved that 56 bits wasn't long enough. Okay. And in 2017, there were some Dutch researchers who claimed to have cracked AES, the, the 256-bit version of that. Now, that's since been disputed. So when they say claimed, they didn't actually provide any evidence for um, it? Well, it, it, it depends what kind of attack. So, the, okay. so there's a brute force attack, which is that you just try all the different combinations until mm. you crack the code. Mm. Um, and this is where... And I know we had a question around quantum computing. We did. That was our next question. What will the impact of quantum exactly. computing be? Yeah. So this is, this is why is quantum going. is a concern. Yeah. Because quantum computing promises the ability to conduct one of those brute force attacks. But rather than it taking thousands of years, mm. um, you know, trying all those possible combinations in the cipher, they can do it with unprecedented power and speed. Now, we can foresee... Again, this is this thing about foresight, but it's not here yet. We can foresee that cracking these encryption standards will, of course, be of interest to criminals and it will be of interest to governments who want to get into people's communications. And what we're already seeing, which I think is really fascinating, um, is we're seeing criminals and governments amassing encrypted mm. data for when they can crack it. Ah, I see. Yeah. So we're getting these kind of data banks, yes. these data lakes okay. that criminals and governments alike are just getting hold of and thinking, yeah, but when quantum really comes on board, we'll be able to crack all of this stuff. So you can see the interest in it mm. and, the, and the exploitation of it. Um, and so there's, there's understandable concern that when that happens, what are we going to do to keep communications secure? And so banks and other big institutions that regularly handle sensitive data, they're already looking into this thing called quantum safe cryptography, mm. which essentially plays that threat from quantum processing, quantum decryption, at its own game. Because rather than using mathematical problems mm. to encrypt and decrypt, it could use quantum key distribution instead and that's probably uh you know for for another talk and well this is what, year three let's say this, <laughs> is what, this is what my thought led so i had some thoughts on the lecture and this is what one of the things that i thought about was the quantum safe encryption so if we are moving towards quantum computing isn't end-to-end -end encryption just going to evolve with it and use quantum computing to order to encrypt itself better. That's it. So it's it's So taking, we can't foresee yeah. it yet. We, well, we can foresee it, but we can't see how it's going to do it yet. But it will happen yeah. because like what computing was in the 70s and 80s, there were lots of problems then which we've cracked. And will I, it just I think evolve? that's right. And, and yeah. I think the, the problem that we have at the moment is trying to guess when that's going to happen. Okay. So quantum computing is not there yet. Mm. I mean, if you if you read the news every morning and you hear that, you know, quantum supremacy has been reached and things like that, you might think, oh, quantum computing is a thing already. It's not really. Where is it being used currently in, in the world that... It's not. It's not at all? No. Okay. You've got a, lot, you've, you've got a few centres that are working on developing quantum computers. Okay. Um, and you obviously, you have... Other services that use supercomputers are existing supercomputers. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of hype around quantum. There's a lot of hype around the threat from quantum decryption. What we're not able to do at this stage is say, right, by 2030, all of our communications will have been decrypted. Mm. We're probably, I, I really hope nobody's going to hold me to this. We're probably looking at at least 2050 okay. before quantum computers will be able to decrypt commonly used encryption. Mm. But we really don't know. Mm. I mean, quantum is hard. Mm. <laughs> so, um, but it's one of those strange things, a little bit like the massive progress that we've made in artificial intelligence in the last couple of years, really. And all of the current hype around chat GPT. Mm. Um, We're all going to be out of a job, aren't we? That's what. Oh, that's gosh, I hope so. Concept. I'm really looking forward to having a bit of a rest. <laughs> um, do, yeah. doing, doing the more creative 
things um, like doing Gresham lectures and not having to do all the kind of routine stuff that I chat do. GPT lectures. All the lectures will be written by a chat bot and we'll yeah, and they that. will. And at the yeah. start, they'll go, "Trust me, yeah. and Chat GPT." <laughs> um, you know that that a little bit like with AI. I think what's going to happen with quantum is that we'll have years and years of the wilderness where we all go, oh, quantum's just kind of fallen off now. It's it's not something to be excited about. And then all of a sudden it will be here. Someone mm. like IBM or somebody in China will say, right, we've got it. But and I then trust- there'll be a massive race. But we're getting ready for it. We are. That's what I trust. We are. Okay. That's enough. Whether now. So the curious thing is we need a bit of continuity, though, because... Mm. I'll probably be retired by the time (laughs) quantum cracks encryption. So you've got nothing to worry about, yeah. So, yeah, exactly. You don't want a bunch of people going, well, it's not going to affect me. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) It will affect everybody. What are your... Our last question, what are your thoughts on homomorphic encryption? Yeah, goodness. Um, a, yeah, that's another and, question. And, and apologies to the person who asked that question because I didn't cover it in the lecture. Yeah. There was a, a, mainly because I had to do a brief history of cryptography in seven, seven and, and a half, half minutes. minutes. We have, as you were saying, we have that challenge of things that we can fit into a 40-minute talk. Yes. And homomorphic encryption... Um, in, in the in the same way that something like client side scanning has been suggested as a means to get around current encryption um, arrangements to make sure that we can still say stay safe, homomorphic encryption is one of the things that's been suggested um, as a remedy mm. or getting ahead of what might happen when, as and when, quantum cracks current encryption algorithms. So, and the idea behind it is that. It converts data into ciphertext, but in such a way that it can still be analysed and worked as if it's still in its original form. Okay. And this has clear benefits for all sorts of business processes. Um, It has clear benefits for things like advertising, potentially. Mm. You know, all of that um, profiling that happens when you send a chat message saying, I'm thinking about buying a new vacuum cleaner. And Mm. all of a sudden you get ads for vacuum cleaners. Mm. Um, Although in hindsight, that could be a good reason not to do it. Um, but equally, if we're thinking about those that quandary around um, scanning for illegal content mm. and harmful content and mm. identifying instances of harm, that you might still be able to do that looking at the patterns of that information. Okay. Um, so it, it's in, in maths, essentially homomorphic, I'm a, I'm a classicist, as you know. So homomorphic mm. means it keeps the same structure. It has mm. the same structure. Mm. Um, and it, it essentially turns one data set into another while preserving those relationships between the elements in both sets of data. So you can see, oh, that mm. was transformed into that. Yeah. Um, so it's it's enabling those mathematical computations to be performed directly on that encrypted data and there are clear benefits of that however mm. as much as it could be really useful for things like data security but also for things like scanning for illegal content it is still far too slow to have any kind of practical use so where is it being applied today it, well it's not really okay um because it's it's a more than a million times slower than performing those operations in yeah. plain text in the clear. Now, what could change this? Well, quantum computing mm. could change this because if you suddenly have at your disposal much quicker, massively scaled up processing power, mm. you might be able to enable homomorphic encryption. Okay, so it's currently dormant but it could become active that's kind in of in a quantum computing world yeah i see so then that's it becomes about that arms race yes. of quantum's here whenever that might be everything's decrypted suddenly oh but we can suddenly use homomorphic mm. encryption yeah so who's flipping those switches i think is the really <laughs> interesting question there our next feature is gresham in the news now we touched upon this mm. at the beginning of the podcast so no place to hide mm. is a campaign that argues that end-to-end encryption aids child sex abusers online and compromises safeguarding. So they're a a campaign group um, which actively tries to argue the point that end-to-end encryption is a bad thing Mm. um, um, because we're essentially allowing 
paedophiles and people, child sex abusers, to communicate online and no one can see what they're talking about. And in in January 22, the government backed this campaign against end-to-end encryption. But the Information Commissioner's Office, um, the UK, basically UK data watchdog, says mm. the technology strengthens children online safety. So the campaign failed. So what are your thoughts on, yeah, on so that I can, story I can, and that campaign? I can wind that back a little bit more, actually. So it was back in 2019, originally, that Mark Zuckerberg, in, in response to a certain extent to the Cambridge Analytica scandal around, you know, inappropriate use of people's data mm. on Facebook, mm. Um, recognising that people wanted greater privacy. Mm. And so he said, right, we're going to introduce end-to-end encryption across all of Facebook family of products, you know, the meta family of products. Mm. Um, And in response, um, the UK Home Secretary at the time, Priti Patel, and her counterparts in UK, US, Australia, Canada, um, sent an open letter Mm. to Mark Zuckerberg saying, um, you know, we, um, we don't, We haven't seen any evidence that you can protect children while introducing end-to-end encryption. Yeah. Which is a fair point. Um, But introducing end-to-end encryption to an entire suite of very popular apps is not a flip switch. It's Mm. not something that happens overnight. So it still hasn't happened. Yeah. Um, The latest announcement, which was from January of this year, 2023, Um, was a blog um, from Meta um, saying that they were... So they have a Sorry, Meta is is the group that now Facebook uh, and WhatsApp are under. Yeah, Yeah, just just for for anyone who doesn't understand. Um, So they already have a standalone end-to-end encrypted version of Messenger. Okay. That's existed for a while. Mm. So um, the controversy is around whether you apply end-to-end encryption to all of the other more open messaging services. So what they've done is that that version that's already end-to-end encrypted, they're building more features into it to see whether, presumably, to see whether what they might do instead is just have an end-to-end encrypted version of Messenger that runs on its own and feels a bit more like Messenger. So it's sort of in a testing phase at the moment well yeah. no that oh. that's already deployed oh that is okay yeah. the testing is that they have been expanding global testing of end-to-end encrypted chats on normal messenger yes okay and then over the next few months they've announced that millions of people around the world will see some of their individual messenger threads become end-to-end encrypted and they said that's going to be at random okay so that they can test people's experience of that how people feel about it um so I mean, it, it, you you said that the campaign failed, and I wouldn't disagree with that mm. because I think if you've got the information commissioner shooting it down mm. and saying, actually, this is a really bad idea also for children's safety, mm. um, then that really highlights the problem. Um, but what has continuously happened, I think, in the rhetoric from governments is to say... We're very pro strong encryption. Kind of brackets, white font, when it applies to people's financial transactions. Yeah. Um, however, we also want to be able to see people's messages. So, want, and you, yeah. you can't have both. They want their cake and eat it. Well, yeah. they want they want both. It's uh, yeah. And 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 cakeism is a good word, but it, I think it's probably a, I would I would say it's probably a bit unfair to the government. I think they're coming from okay. a good place. Yes. Okay. As a lot of other governments might not be. Yeah. Um, but essentially, you know, in, in the lecture, I talk about weighing one person's safety against another person's safety and saying, mm. well, is the, is the safety of a child more important than the safety of a journalist? Mm. I wouldn't want to have to make that decision. I actually resent us all being put in that position where we're being led one way or another. Mm. Um, but equally, and I think that the information commissioner's comments are really interesting here, because children have different rights. Mm. Yes, they have. They absolutely have a right to, you know, protection from exploitation. Mm. They also have a right to privacy. They also have a right to freedom of expression. So it's really important that we recognise that we need to balance those rights and not just say assume that one is more important than all the others. And an example would be if you have a, a young person who's exploring their sexuality 
but whose parents disapprove of the fact that they might be gender fluid or they might have a, an, a sexual interest that they don't approve of. And there might be a threat of violence attached to that. I would absolutely want that young person's messages to be private for their own safety. Mm. And so as much as it feels very difficult, doesn't it, to disagree with the idea that we want to protect children online, Mm. protecting children online, we have to recognise, means lots of different things, not just being able to scan their content. Yeah. It's all about context. Mm. Because life is context. Like, yeah. it, it's, it it throws up all these different scenarios. You can't just, like you said, have a blanket rule for everything because then it, it, it misses out yeah. um, a lots of other different uh, different scenarios. And, and I think that was something that came across, you know, when we did... Um, so the, the Sun newspaper very kindly ran some polls for us on end-to-end encryption. As seen in your lecture, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I was really pleased about this, not just because it was free and they were really happy to do it, but also because... So many assumptions are made about what members of the public think about these issues. And they're really tricky issues. Mm. But assumptions are also made that, oh, you know, you're too stupid to think about these things because it's complex and it's tech and, oh, it's ethically challenging. No, Mm. absolutely. You know, some readers are voters. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) They absolutely should be asked what they think about these issues. Yeah. And they came back with some really interesting quite nuanced, quite complex answers. So Mm. while I don't have the stats to hand and you are encouraged to watch the lecture to see the stats and and the transcript as well. Um, You know, when they were asked the question, do you want Facebook to encrypt your chats? Everybody was quite split about that. Mm. And we got some really good, really honest, hmm, I'm not sure. But when they were asked, you know, should the government be able to read your private messages? It was a resounding... No, they really shouldn't. Yes, because that's a more... The question is more definitive. I think people's understanding of what encryption is, which I hope in this podcast we've shed some light on people who who didn't have an understanding um, before listening to this about what encryption actually is and what it means. I think that the ambiguity of that word possibly Mm. led to the results being a bit half and half because people don't actually know what does that actually mean. It leads us on to to a really recent um, news story, actually, in February of this year, 2023, the BBC reported that Signal would walk from the UK if online safety bill undermined encryption was the headline. So essentially the online safety bill, this controversial bill we mentioned at the top mm. of the lecture, and, and as, as, as we said before, it's in the committee stage. This is now an app or a company threatening to leave the UK, as you alluded to before, people could be leaving jurisdictions if the government pose restrictions and things on them so yeah what 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 do you think what do you think of this story yeah so i thought and and i think you know we've had a um a a, an update to this really in the last couple of days the idea um uh, as expressed by the heads of whatsapp the head of signal uh, and other messaging services that they issued an open letter urging the government to rethink the provisions on um end-to-end encryption in in the online safety bill um because there is an there's an implicit um, mm. understanding in the text of the bill that it's basically undermining mm. end-to-end encryption, mm. which, as we said, is the default way to secure messaging now. You know, it's not a newfangled, slightly shady way of doing it. It's how everybody does it. It's how yeah. Apple does it. So if if Apple were to follow suit, imagine if we couldn't use iMessage mm. In the UK, I mean, it's it's kind of it's unthinkable yeah. now because they're um, so ingrained in our society and yeah. so ingrained in in how we communicate. It's, yeah. our, it's basically the way that the whole country communicates. This is essentially the platforms well, we use. When I worked for Facebook, as it was, we used to be quite amused in the UK because if Facebook ever went down in the US, mm. people would call nine one one. They'd call the emergency <laughs> services. And that sounds a bit foolish, but actually, yeah. it's just an indication of the extent to which people think of these apps as utilities. They're critical infrastructure. They're services like having electricity and water, you know. Mm. Um, and and it, it, to the idea that we suddenly wouldn't have some of these, you know, the world's largest platforms, it's kind of 
unthinkable, I think, to most consumers. Mm. Um, I mean, what would we do? We'd be go, going back to SMS, probably. Well, this something is like the, that. What, what, what I was thinking of, I just thought of now, is in the context of the pandemic, how important were these messaging apps mm. for people communicating with loved ones, their family, Absolutely. their friends, when they couldn't leave their house? Um, to not have that would have been the last lifeline of a lot of mm. people and really sent, you know, sent a lot of people over the edge. And it's interesting because also in America, you think of people being so isolated as well. They're, they're more isolated than we are in terms of geographically. You get people living in the middle of yeah. nowhere. You get people living in the middle of nowhere in the UK, but in the US, it's 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 a larger thing. And, and these apps and the way that people communicate, especially over Facebook as well, is, mm. is, is massive for their lives. It's how they how they live their lives yeah and particularly because i think one of the things we saw in the pandemic was a proliferation of voice chat right so yes. suddenly zoom teams were the way to do work but also yes how to keep in touch with your friends and family at the other side of the world or in the other street where you weren't allowed to travel yeah um and so you know this has become such an essential part of our lives but you know we mentioned signal um, everybody that I work with in the security community, they use Signal. Why would someone use Signal and not WhatsApp? Is it just another competitor? Mm. Do they do the same thing or sort of, yeah? It's interesting. It's it's perception, really. Okay. okay. I think when WhatsApp was acquired by Facebook in 2014, mm. we saw a bunch of people move to Telegram. Yes. Um, and And a number of other smaller apps. Actually, you know, Telegram isn't end to end encrypted, but oh, really? but people moved simply because there was a perception that because WhatsApp had been acquired by Facebook, mm. Facebook would then be able to read people's WhatsApp messages, which of course they can't. Okay, so they <laughs> because want, they're yeah. end to end encrypted. <laughs> but that was the that was the the understanding. So people yeah. wanted to move to an app which had no ties to exactly big tech exactly in inverted commas. Um, okay. So Signal is another of those platforms that people move to when they think that WhatsApp can read their messages. Yeah. Um, now, I could be wrong, but my recollection is that... So um, with some apps, and I, and I can't honestly remember whether it's Signal in particular, some apps are end-to-end -end encrypted, but then we'll use things like Amazon Web Servers. Mm for the transit of that data so when, when they come to rest of course it's not encrypted so, <laughs> so that's that there's that link there yeah. with a big tech with yeah. amazon yeah so, uh, so a so lot of there. it mm. can be about perception of security rather than there being that much to choose between them and i think a lot of people have moved to signal simply because whatsapp is owned by meta and that was a really insightful and interesting discussion. So thank you for joining me. I, I learned a lot and I hope our listeners learned a lot too. Again, if you haven't watched that lecture, you could find it on our website and you can find it on our YouTube channel. It's called What's the Problem with Encryption? If you visit gresham.ac.uk and type in either Dr. Victoria Baines or if you type in What's the Problem with Encryption, you'll find that lecture and you'll find all of our other lectures on there as well. Your last lecture of mm. this series is Cybersecurity for Humans yes. on May the 9th, 6 o'clock at our home, Barnards in Hall. What's that about? What are you going to be talking about in that lecture? Have yes. you, yeah, have well, you as, written it? As you it? know, and as some of our listeners will know, I'm not a fan of scaring the hell out of people when it comes to online safety. Okay. Um, and in my last lecture, which was all about whether we can treat cybersecurity and online safety as a public health issue, mm. Um, I did it, something of a critique of how we talk about cyber security. It's full of scary guys in hoodies that don't have faces and are going to take you to hell. That was something you, well, it was interesting. The imagery that you used in your last lecture in the, was you, you showed us some images. So when you type in cybersecurity online, mm. you get the image of the man in a hoodie yeah. with, you know, in front of a keyboard typing away with binary and matrix style code behind him and stuff. It's quite interesting. And blue, lots of blues and lots, lots of greens of and stuff. Um, and I'm that's a what you fan get. of the Google image search. Yes. Of course, that's, that's what, quote unquote, ordinary people yeah. are presented with when they look for things like, how do I protect myself from cybercrime? Yeah. No, that's, we actually really want to enable people and tell them what they can do in terms of, you know, like in the pandemic, hands, face, space. 
um, you know, give something, pe give people something that is actionable and really simple to do. Um, so it's all very well my suggesting that how we're doing it in cybersecurity is all wrong. Mm. I need to have a better idea for how we do this. Yeah. Um, and so my final lecture is really breaking down some of those common threats that you'll hear being talked about, botnets, ransomware, phishing, mm. and taking a little bit of a linguistic approach. So saying, well, why do we call it phishing? And how does phishing morph into vishing and smishing and spear phishing and whaling? How do, you know, how do we end up with cybersecurity being a foreign language mm. that we have to learn? So dispelling all of that, breaking it all down and saying, right, these are the things that people can do. These are the processes that we need. This is how technology can help. For me, the entire series around humanizing cyberspace is to put people back at the heart of how we manage the internet, how yes. we keep people safe online, how we make decisions, some of those tough choices around, you know, whose safety is more important, mm. um, who gets to make the rules, whose ethics, all of those things. And so it's really nice to be able to put our money where our mouths are and engage with the public. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so this was any further questions. It was a Gresham podcast. Thank you. Thank you.